Hey guys, Connor from Unleash the Ghouls here. Just a heads up on the context for this video. I originally edited this for the channel a while back under the name Why A Clockwork Orange Is A Horror Movie. It was removed for copyright, but now I've decided to go back and make some tweaks and I'm now releasing it again as a Nightmare Fuel episode. It wasn't originally scripted as a Nightmare Fuel, but the content pretty much is just a Nightmare Fuel. So here you go, enjoy. Welcome one, welcome all, and welcome to a deep discussion where I, Connor, delve into the rabbit hole of randomness and break down topics of terror. There's going to be some spoilers ahead, so get ready and let's jump right into it. 1971's A Clockwork Orange, directed by Stanley Kubrick, based on the novel by Anthony Burgess, is a film I've adored for a very long time, a definite top 10 movie for me. Definitely one of my favourites in the genre of horror... hang on, with dystopian crime? I mean, alright, yeah, it, it is. Um, what does IMDb reckon? Crime, drama, sci-fi? Um, yeah, all of those. Rotten Tomatoes? Classics, drama, mystery and suspense, science fiction and fantasy. Wow, okay. Metacritic? Sci-fi, drama, thriller, crime. I know A Clockwork Orange is a blend of a lot of various genres and takes influence from many areas, but out of all of those different genres used to describe it, not once is the word horror mentioned. Why? Whenever you see lists of greatest horror movies, A Clockwork Orange is never brought to attention in any capacity. It seems as though horror as a genre doesn't apply in any way to the movie, but I strongly believe that it does, and that even if A Clockwork Orange can be listed under half a dozen genres, horror definitely has to be one of them. This video is going to go into a lot of depth, so if you've never seen the film before, avert your gaze now because I'm going to discuss some very specific scenes. A non-spoiler summary of the film is that if you're a fan of other Kubrick films like The Shining, you'll be able to enjoy this one. The film's focused on a young boy, Alex, and his addiction to violence and sex, which leads to his imprisonment and becoming part of an experiment to try and remove his dangerous nature. That's roughly the IMDb synopsis, so there we go. If that intrigues you, go and check out the film. From here on out, this video is going to be my analysis as to why I think A Clockwork Orange is a horror movie. But first, we need to identify some of the horror genre's key characteristics and see if they apply. The traits I believe can apply to a horror movie are creating a sense of fear or dread, violence, death, and disturbing images which can make you feel uneasy. This video essay should be a piece of piss then. So, to talk about the main narrative of A Clockwork Orange more in depth, Alex DeLarge is a teenage boy who has a lust for a bit of the old ultra-violence. He's the leader of a gang who he addresses as his droogs, who go out on a night and generally cause chaos to the world. They bully and aggressively beat an old homeless man to near death for no reason whatsoever other than it being fun. Already we're seeing a violent disturbing image. The entire scene doesn't need to happen. Alex and his droogs haven't been threatened in any way by the old man, but they proceed to harshly kick him and beat him with sticks anyway, just for the fun of it. As antagonists go right off the bat, this makes Alex a psychopath, somebody who chases the thrill of spilling blood in the streets for a personal rush. So the night progresses and the Droogs encounter a rival gang led by Billy Boy, who we first see raping a young girl. She struggles desperately trying to escape, but the gang overpower her. So if you want to talk dread, here you go, here's a rape scene. Then the Droogs arrive and a full on brawl ensues. People get bottled, launched through tables, it's wild. Again, the violent nature of Alex comes to the forefront because this entire fight didn't need to happen. Alex just wants to establish dominance by injuring and potentially killing people, all for pure enjoyment. Further down the line, we get some more violent acts culminating in a pinnacle point of the film's narrative, the singing in the rain scene. The droogs break into the house of an old man and his wife. They beat the old man and rape his wife in front of his eyes, all while having a bouncy ball taped into his mouth like a gag. Alex cuts holes into the wife's clothing with scissors while he jovially sings the title track of the classic Gene Kelly movie. That adds an extra level of uneasiness to the film, the juxtaposition of such a happy song being sang while committing a disgustingly terrible act only further highlights that Alex is being childlike and playful. Raping and injuring people to him is a game. He feels free to psychologically damage people, all because he's never personally felt the effects firsthand. Alex's dominance continues when he feels insulted by his droogs, almost 
like he's paranoid that his place as the leader is being compromised. So how does he respond? By talking the situation over reasonably? <laughs> no, he pushes Georgie and Dim into a river and then when trying to help them out, slices Dim's hand with a concealed blade. That's the only way Alex knows to establish power by shedding blood and that's the mark of a villain. Then on the next evening of thrill seeking, the gang stumble across the home of a cat lady who after yet another break-in, Alex murders by bludgeoning her head with an enormous ceramic penis. Yep, there we have it, a rapist and a bully before but now Alex is officially a murderer. His reaction is a stunned one, it's like a person finally coming face to face with one of their childhood dreams. He's amazed and taken aback by the fact he's responsible for the death of an innocent person. But the fun is cut short when he is given a receipt from the droogs by having a fucking full bottle of milk smashed across his face. Christ, this film's an easy watch isn't it? They say you shouldn't cry over spilled milk but considering there's glass in his eyes, Alex does and he's arrested for his crimes. Now we start to feel another threat. Before, Alex was causing chaos to the world but now we see the prison system start to cause chaos to Alex. Police officers speak to him like shit, hit him, he gets spat in the face. Then once in prison, he's handled aggressively and military-like by the prison officers. Due to being a handsome young fella, he's even eyed up for some drop the soap action. The outside world was depicted as Alex's plaything to destroy and the dystopian architecture of the world, courtesy of Stanley Kubrick's vision, matches that destruction. Everything's crumbling, decayed, out of order, much like Alex's personality. But in the prison, even though everything's much cleaner and neater, there is still a threat, just this time the threat of the inmates wanting to get their hands on Alex rather than Alex being the one to dish out the harm. And this begins to change Alex as a person. Now he's in a position where he no longer feels like a leader. He's not a name, he's a number in a remorseless system, being hounded by others even more dangerous than he is. He's out of his depth. So he turns to reading the Bible, albeit only really enjoying the violent parts, before he's given a potentially life-changing offer, and a crucial offer for the argument of this video. Alex is given the opportunity to be a guinea pig in a new experiment, the Ludovico experiment, which has apparently been designed to reform the evil from people and make sure that they are never evil again for the rest of their lives, or at least that's what the rumours going around are. Sounds like a dream, right? Do a few tests, get put better, get out of jail early. Win-win, right? Instead, what we get is a contributor to the horror genre's trait of disturbing imagery, possibly the most iconic imagery in the film. The Ludovico experiment involves Alex having his eyes forced open by a mechanical headset which attaches to his eyelids and stretches them wide to the point where he can't close them. And then he's sat in a chair for hours on end in front of violent film footage all while playing classical music, which is coincidentally his favourite genre of music to listen to, particularly Beethoven. Just look at this image. Those tiny metal clamps attached to your eyelids is a disgusting, unsettling image to look at, horrifying in every sense. People are afraid of getting needles or swabs or cameras inside them, but just look at this fucking thing. Christ, does the game change at this point? In the long run, the experiment works so that whenever Alex either hears classical music, has sexual feelings, or witnesses violent acts, by association with the experiment, he involuntarily gags and struggles for breath. It's all a psychosomatic reaction brought on by the experiment. When he leaves prison, this reaction actually doesn't help Alex at all, and now we enter the third act of the film, which is an entirely different dimension to the horror of Alex. Now we see the consequences of his actions. In the first act of the film, Alex gets away with being an evil bastard because he doesn't face any consequences, until his self-corruption of power leads to his long overdue betrayal at the hands of the Droogs. Now he's got to face the horrors of his past head on, but with the inability to respond. He can no longer be violent in any way, so he's lost access to his only way of solving problems. At first, Alex returns home to his parents, who now despise him and don't want anything to do with him. Earlier in the film, they're very soft and feel intimidated by Alex, but now the tides have turned and they reject their son's existence. So right away, Alex's prison release isn't going well for him. Alex encounters the old homeless man again and is recognised as his attacker. So he gets his receipt in a hilarious way. All of the other elderly homeless gang up on him and assault him. This really is an eye for an eye on a scale that is of Goliath size to Alex personally. Good job the ruckus is dealt with by two nearby police officers. Ah, oh, 
fuck, it's Georgie and Dim, and now it's their turn to get in on the revenge. In another massively unsettling scene, Alex is driven into the middle of the woods where he has his head pushed underwater in this random bathtub that's just sitting in a field. And this goes on for ages. As the film watcher, I was in awe at how long Malcolm McDowell is under the water. It's fucking brutal. Now with no family, no friends, nowhere to go, Alex wanders the unknown until he stumbles across a warm home, a place of salvation that might help him, but oh shit, it's the singing in the rain home. Now things get tense and uncomfortable beyond belief. The old man's now crippled with PTSD after Alex learns his wife died after her rape. Damn. But the old man doesn't recognise Alex, of course, because he was masked up. But then, like an idiot, Alex starts singing Singing in the Rain in the Bath, and that's when the film switches. The revenge mission has switched over to the old man, who recognises Alex's voice. It's his turn to break Alex. I'll leave the plot of the film there, as I've covered pretty much all the points I want to, but Christ, this is a crazy one. There's so much violence, blood, death, cruelty, abuse, bullying, threat, all while providing a nauseous mood that disconcerts the viewer. Combining that with Stanley Kubrick's cinematography choice adds to that disturbance, as there are so many scenes that have bizarre otherworldly imagery that further fuels the macabre nature of the film. Back in 1971, this savage clusterfuck of a movie caused a huge stir to audiences. Though it was nominated for a Best Picture Oscar, it was still met with challenges. It was withdrawn from release in the UK in 1973, after being linked to a trial case of a violent 14-year-old, and both Kubrick and his wife had protesters outside their home. It wasn't until Kubrick's death in 1999 when the UK withdrawal was lifted. A Clockwork Orange was also banned in South Africa until 1984, Ireland until 2000, and Singapore until 2011. If a movie is so frightening and horrifying that it needed to be hidden from public viewing in some countries for decades, surely that's as good a testament as any to support the fact that even though A Clockwork Orange covers a lot of genres, horror should definitely be considered as one of them. I'm Connor, signing off from Unleash the Ghouls. I'll vidi well next time, brothers.